Welcome to Crest in partnership with Elusive. Producer Dodd here and proud to introduce an unplanned episode. Chances like this don't come around very often, so we had to take the current when it served. Rob and Rhino have had a great chat with Gabe Davis, covering a range of pertinent topics from environmental activism to memories of the golden days and some wonderful travel tales. Also, when you hear the helicopter noise halfway through, there's no need to look out the window, it's on the recording. We recorded this episode at The Wave in Bristol and they were kind enough to loan us one of their glamping pods to use as a studio. It was an amazing place to make a podcast and it shows in the outcome, I think. Before our theme, Punks of Harlech, comes on, we now have a release date for the single. It will be on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music and everywhere else coinciding with our final episode of the year on the 29th of November. Anyway, housekeeping done, let's go. What a great chat between Gabe Davis, Rob and Rhino. Here they are. We're at the Blue Earth Summit in Bristol's The Wave to meet a very special guest indeed. Put simply, Gabriel Davis is one of the most influential figures in British surfing history, both in the water and as a personality. <laughs> we'll talk accolades, travel, movies, memories and legacy with the man himself. As you heard there, an opportunity not to be missed. We are on location today at one of our favourite surfing spaces in the country, the magical inland lagoon, which pumps every day with a regularity that would put even deep art to shame. And what a guest, worthy indeed of an extra bonus episode as we go into the back end of our 2021 season. Given that Gabe Davis divides his time between the south of France and the northeast of England, when we heard he was going to be so close to Crest HQ, we knew it was time to make the quick dash up the motorway. Plus, there was the chance to sneak in a cheeky surf as well. Gabe, producer Dodd, myself and Rob are still soaking wet after a great little surf on the right here at the Wave and we are now sitting in a very cosy stroke posh glamping studio to record, record the podcast which has been very kindly loaned to us by the great people here at the Wave. So boys, Gabe, that was a good surf wasn't it? How was that? It was really good wasn't it? Such a good vibe when you're in the water out there. That's right, guaranteed surf, can't fault it. And it was still warm. We're in October. Four threes, no boots and no gloves. You can't. I did a three two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, Love craggy. <laughs> Plenty of waves. I, I think this time as well. I well, you stole the show, Gabe. I I wouldn't say on that. I, was, I don't know if I was the best twin fin in the water. There was another one sitting next to me who was also shredding <laughs> on a twin fin. Very you. Thank you. But um. That's yeah, such a fun fun setup. And the setup here is amazing. Like and the first time I've seen these camping tent pods they're phenomenal aren't they super really nice are. the wave set up amazing the building's amazing the vibe's brilliant it was uh, interesting seeing a few of you out of, well me included actually out of breath after the double a couple of times <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, I say that was me <laughs> <laughs> anyway welcome to Crest in partnership with Elusive and thanks for your time Gabe we really appreciate you coming on now you're here for the Blue Earth Summit which at the time of release will have actually played out along with subsequent media coverage. But nonetheless, I think it's a good place to start. Um, can you perhaps tell us a little bit about what you're hoping to get from the coming two days here at the Blue Earth Summit? Yeah, so it's a gathering of um, sort of industry, I'd say. So it's yeah. sort of aimed at sort of corporate level, changing sort of systems, changing business to be more sustainable, to put more like positive spin on things. And um, so it's basically two days of really good speakers, um, inspiring talks, like keynote speakers, there's a film night tomorrow night. And it's not just surfing, it's the wider sort of industries. Um, so I'm here representing Patagonia, uh, who I work for. Yeah. And I've got a little, there's obviously a surfing, quite a bit of surfing on the side of it because it's come from the main crew at the Wavelength, the Wavelength magazine. So they're sort of driving it. So it's got a very heavy surf slant, mm. but it, it's going to, you know, we're talking about the outdoors and, um, you know, why, did, why didn't the industry as a whole? Yeah, because I looked at the uh, the list of guest speakers and it's, it's I think there's like 50 plus guys coming, isn't there? It's and it's full, like full day events. It's in a, a couple of different rooms. There's like a pitching venue where I think startups, like enviro-based startups can pitch in for venture capitalist funding, mm. film nice, fun presentation. It's pretty, it's pretty good, good setup. And we, we've mentioned... The, the wave itself but 
uh, you and I gave had a chat at the bar, and what a brilliant place to hold it as well, isn't it? It's kind of got a ski resort vibe about it, a beautiful bar restaurant area, and I suppose the perfect place to hold such, yeah. A, such an event. Yeah, so, the, so I think the first day is a place called, uh, well, somewhere in the centre of town, um, and then the second day is out of the wave where literally everyone gets, has a chance to surf, or if they're not surfers, they can you know, swim of course, or yeah. do whatever. Um, but yeah, I think the, the Thursday will be more chill day, but probably a bit more conversations okay. might happen then. And you mentioned that the event has quite a heavy surf slant. Do you, we're going to get into the nitty gritty now, do you think it's the, the responsibility of every surfer to be aware of the challenges of our oceans and then of course the, the planet facing as well? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because we've, we've, again, as we've been saying, like everyone's seen the last two years, the surf world has just boomed mm, really across has. Europe, across the world. Massive. So there's so many new surfers have started in the last two years. So then the question might, might be more like, is it the surfer's responsibility? Or I, I would actually put it the other way around. I'd say it's more the industry's responsibility mm-hmm. because the startup surfers like, give me the board, give me the wetsuit, give me the wave. Mm. I've got such a steep learning to go. Like, mm. I want to get to my feet and ride the wave. I haven't got time to like figure out what's going on, but it's almost like the community that we're in, or the you know we're all like second generation surfers. I think or mm. we've got little ones that are surfing, so we've got this. Or we're part of this community that we've known each other for many years, and and have been involved in the industry, and we know all the people from you know walks of life within the surf industry. And to me, it's more like the change probably isn't going to come from the surfers. The no. change has to come from the industry. To me, I, th- I think that's um, true of kind of environmentalism in general isn't it all too often it's put on the the little guy rather than the big corporations taking responsibility and so it's, re- it's really interesting interesting to hear you put it that way around i, th- I think because th- there's answers out there and it's um yeah and obviously you know we can't not every server can buy the most enviro wet no. or the most like oh, this board's got bio resin in it like mm. you know we can't all drive teslas like we'd no. love to but we can't it's like so you have to be like a, like realistic but... i think to see it through that lens though is helpful that the, the responsibility falls at the big guy the corporations the companies the, the people that have the, the capacity to kind of initiate that change yeah that's the way i see it so the so i guess my like my position at patagonia is a lot of that is the patagonia is this company that's um you know, light years ahead of most of the other clothing businesses in the world. Mm. And it's obviously a heavily outdoor-based company. Mm. The surfing's a small slice of it. But then my, like, little world, obviously, or our world, is, like, full we're in surf three, six, five days a year. Like, we're fully involved. Mm. So it's like, how do we... And I think but we came to surfing from, like, that counterculture age where we were, like, surfing was the alternative thing to do. Like, you guys are probably, like, from rugby towns or from Newcastle. That's like, right. Football yeah. town. Yeah, like, yeah. All the kids in the school play football. No, me and my mate want to go surfing. Yeah. I was like, rugby's a thing. I was like, okay, you don't like rugby, but actually we're passionate about this other thing. So it was, like, it was always, like, going against the grain. Where yeah, I grew up. definitely. And what I loved about surfing then was that it was this, like, tribe of alternatives. And okay, maybe now that's not the case. Like, the, my, you know, every car between here and L- mm-hmm. London's got a surfboard on it, whatever. It's like, there's a lot more surfers and it's not counterculture. But I'd like to think that a lot of those people that have made a lot of money out of surfing, or the businesses that have grown up around surfing, the industries, the, biz- you know, the, you know, at a certain point it was big business. We can say, you can argue like the big corp- surf corporations mm-hmm. might have like, gone bust and shrank a bit mm. but there's all the new startups and some of the new startups are probably where the magic is because I sort of lost faith in the big guys making a difference yeah. I think so and you talk about like those issues that you know that, which are a problem right now were you aware like from a young age of those issues or have, has that come about recently through working for Patagonia and um, when I was a, a young, like, I want to say, probably like 16, 17, 18, yeah. I first met the guys from Surf Against Sewage, so I was on the beach at yeah. Hartlepool. Yeah. Hartlepool is like, of all the beaches in the world you don't want to go to, <laughs> this is probably the place. <laughs> like, <laughs> sewage pipes. Oh, wow. It's like, there's like, you're on the Tees estuaries, there's like, it, British Steel, ICI, nuclear oh, reprocessing yeah. plant. Yeah. It's like... I think at the time it was 10,000 times over the like EC limit for <laughs> pollution. It's just utter rank water quality. Yeah. And so we never really surfed there much, but there's a little crew of surfers that were there. They're all kind of crazy. Some of them might still be like, who knows? But they're like, <laughs> surfing and sewage, like, we're going to Hartlepool. You're from the East Coast crew. Do you want to come join us? I was like, yeah, I'm coming down. Like, 
to like you know 40 minutes from the house yeah I'll go, yeah of course we'll come down and we got there and the guys in the gas mask and the sewage, sewage pipes and the press are there and i was like mm. these guys are awesome mm. yeah. like this is like that was one of like turning points in my life i'm like okay we, we sort of gather as a bunch of surfs on the beach but seeing the way they operate yeah and they made the headlines in the papers and they like because they turned up, they cared, and they're from you know, all those guys came from Cornwall, really. They went right. from our area, so they yeah. came into our zone, taught us about how to do it, highlighted the problems that we didn't really know were a problem, but we just, that was just standard for us. And from that point on, I'm like, these are the crew mm. that are as important as watching Tom Curran, Tom Carroll, whoever was in the magazines at the time. Like, yeah, that's right. Day glow stickers on the boards that were there in like the early 90s. That was a, a yeah. That they certainly, I think, left. That was my first experience, uh, and where it became ingrained on me when I saw the the guys at uh, Surf Skin. I'm thinking of like South Wales. Like I remember there was a time there was they had a, a big double decker bus. It was like actually Quicksilver sponsored. It. it was one of the cool things Quicksilver did. They sponsored this big double decker bus, and it was like Gary Cong El- Elkton and I don't know if Carl was there, but they had like uh, yeah. loads of the people that you you know we all like grew up surfing with. It's like you know. That generation of surfers, and they did this like roadshow tour of like the double decker bus would rock up to Langland and we'd do a that's demo right, on the gosh, day. I can remember the SAS Toxic Trophy that's at Langland, yeah, like yeah. all that sort of know, stuff. This is that the was one of my days, first yeah. contest. I remember crying because I was so cold. <laughs> 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 they didn't even give me gas mask to get yeah. warm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the worst ice cream headache as like a seven year old. But that was like, say, <laughs> Steve England and Chris Hines. And Chris you know, Hines was like, the guy, he was yeah. he's, he's the staying still the main he's, man. He's not, no, it's uh, Hugo Tagholm now. Like, Chris has stepped out and he's doing other awesome sustainability work mm. and Hugo sort of taken that foundation and moved it on to it to a level of okay we were there shouting out sewage and industrial pollution and you know trying to change like local policy and they were um the, their other tactic at the time was like um shareholder the power of shareholders so mm-hmm. they'd be you know they buy the water companies privatized mm-hmm. they buy shares in the company then anyone can then go to the AGM so the S guys from SES go into the AGM right. dressed in suits no and then say, look what we found on your beach and just hold up a bag of wow. whatever you found on the beach and wow. all the stuff that's flushed down the toilet. Yeah. So it's that shareholder activism. That was like the early days of SES. Now where Hugo's at with it now is would be an awesome guest for you guys as well, but he's at like the level where he's, okay, they've got the community. They've got uh, plastic-free communities around the coast. They've got regional reps. They've got hundreds of supporters, thousands of supporters on the beaches around the country. But they're also in government, um, and they're changing. They're trying to change legislation in government with MPs getting it's a, a policy you, level. You've got, yeah, you've got to go in at policy level. You've got to get the MPs on side. You've got to get sort of political. That's how you're going to make change. Mm. If we can beach clean all day long, every day from now until eternity. Do you know what? I think they've done a, a really good job. I, you've said, Gabe. There's a car. There's a, a surfboard in every car from here to London, and every man and his dog seems to surf now. We were talking about this earlier as well. Um, but surfing, when when certain people want to, surfing can still be dressed up as like, oh, they're just a bunch of surfers, and kind of disregarded as a bunch of dropouts, whatever. I think Surfers Against Surge have done a really good job of kind of galvanising the image that, you know, surfers aren't, we're not a bunch of dropouts. There are people in, um, they're professionals of all walks of life in surfing from all sorts of different careers, and... You know, it's uh, they've given it a professional face, I think, haven't they? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a real organisation with teeth. Like almost, you know, could, could stand next to any of the big NGOs, Absolutely, and yeah. like it's it does make fantastic. Change. And it's also yeah, it's not just surfers, and it's not just sewage anymore. It's gone way beyond mm. all of those yeah. issues. But it's, it's it's it was was it last year? I think um, you had a hand in this as well. Um, uh, Prince Charles met with uh, Hugo and a few. Uh, representatives, didn't he? So that was it's... just before the lockdown, yeah. the world collapsed. That was the last uh, big sort of public event we went to, actually. So, I mean, royalty are on board with it, so it's, yeah. uh, it's, it really does have that kind of that um, punching power now, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, yeah, they're a force, a real force for good. So I guess the message to, you know, get involved with, with those guys or other groups like that, you know, there's m- m- many organisations, mm. which is really good. But yeah, they're the sort of flagship crew for sure. Yeah. Cool. So I think, um, well, I mean, just sort of staying on that subject just a little bit, you've travelled like extensively worldwide, uh, obviously in the sea surfing. Um, 
And like, have you sort of seen a lot of great changes in the oceans? Like, obviously, we've been sur- you've been surfing uh, quite a number of years, just like me. I think you might be a bit younger than me, but um, have you seen a lot of change? Like, I, I remember going to the Mentawis, uh, and I had a twenty-year gap between the two trips. And on the second trip, I remember noticeably when I was putting my head under the water, and there was a, a, dist- a distinct lack of fish. You know, and that really was a real shock to me. You know, have, have you have you seen a lot of? I don't know. Um, I guess locally, hard to tell, isn't it? I mean, I guess it depends where you go in the world. Like locally, where I live in Northumberland at the minute, um, we've actually seen like it's an amazing amount of dolphins. Don't right. ask me why, but they're literally like dolphins going past the door every day, like yeah, labradoodles or whatever. Yeah, so there's like mm-hmm. literally, and that was something that never happened when I was a youngster. Mm. So I don't know whether that's a a good thing or a bad thing? Is, well, it, we, is it food? Is it temperature? I mean, who actually? I mean, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, well, funny enough, in Porthcawl, we've also mm. seen the same. We've seen a, a huge increase in, in dolphins, and I, in all the years I've lived there, I don't think I've ever seen so many as I have this summer, and leading up and actually last summer too. So that was obviously a good thing. It must be the the the, the there's food there season. for them. Exactly. Yeah, there's food there for them. So yeah. So uh, yeah. See, so, um, just going back to the northeast, then, like growing up in the ocean. Like, for you, was it like as a kid? Was like like your sort of childhood was was like for me actually surfing was a bit of an escape. Was it for you? Was it was it like that? Like because you're a I know you're a big fan of Newcastle United. Yeah, like so my dad uh, first started surfing. Well, I don't know if he'd say he was a surfer, but he first started bodyboarding at Caswell. So his boat clipped in the mumbles. In the mumbles, yeah, yeah. Be and careful, so, claim you as one of our own. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I think at one point he did say, do you want to surf for Wales? But I never <laughs> quite got there. But um, So he started, and then his art- artist friend, he, he uh, a guy called Richard Harris, I think also lived in South Wales, actually. Phenomenal sculptor. He got us into surfing as young lads and I've got three brothers so me and my brother we had one board one wetsuit between us and it was like a race who could get home from school first <laughs> get the wetsuit on and you'd get to go surfing <laughs> so it was like a race to get home to go surfing and then you know do you remember I watched it with the boys oh we'll go down to Cornwall because there's ways in Cornwall so off we go to Cornwall and yeah. then, oh we'll go to the Gower we'll go to the Gower and then, we, and then you'll go oh we'll go to France and then boom you're in like Hostel and you're like oh my god there's a different world out there yeah and I, so they were amazing to take on this little ju- these little journeys, you know, weekends away, weeks away, all the, all this sort of stuff. But in Newcastle at the time, it was a super like counterculture affairs. Like there's a generation of surfers above me that were phenomenal, full uh, like pioneers. Yeah. So obviously we were never the first, but and we were influenced by these guys, um, and you know we just basically followed in their footsteps. Um, but it was a very still a very like. You know, there's no the nearest surf shop was probably whatever. And where else? I can't even think. It's probably like wave graffiti. Well, I need some wax. We're gonna go, yeah, yeah. Or like what? Yeah. Or so where was the closest? Was it in Scarborough? Was it was Secret Spot? No, or? I don't think they were even there. Oh, no. the first one was there. There was in Saltburn. Was in the back of Gary Rogers' oh, yes. van. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a van, <laughs> so it was in the back of his van, and he'd like drive around. And you'd buy a block of wax. It was awesome. So it was like super like remote. You felt isolated, but then because of that you were a bit of a tribe and on the east coast you get far less waves than on the west coast so you're really desperate for those waves like when they come you're like watching the weather charts and you're like the keenest of the keen yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you come from the back end backwater where it's black and white world of football and city life and da 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 but you're like we've got another world out there yeah and once you're in you're in you, you can't you know everyone knows that once you're in exactly like, you can't get out yeah and now uh, given that we're back in the northeast and alluding to Gromit Hood, can we ask about one of your first major breakthroughs, the Teenage Diaries for BBC Two? One of our hosts, uh, Tom, was saying that he remembers seeing this as a Grom himself, and that at the time it came out, he felt like a, it was a real milestone in the UK surfing's uh, ability to attract mainstream media coverage. Yeah, that was... Um, so that would have been about... 90, very early 90s, like 70, it was probably so yeah. maybe 92, maybe? I think, was. Yeah, so you were ni- I think you might have been 19. I was probably, probably a bit younger, probably like 18. Was probably just, I was just doing my A-levels. A-levels, that's right, yeah. I'd just doing the last year of A-levels. It was 93, it was. 93. I watched it two days ago. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, producer, Dad. <laughs> Still haunted. <laughs> 
So uh, I've never seen this, but I've heard about this from my parents. It's worth a watch. Yeah. It is brilliant. brilliant. There's some good surf in there too. Some really oh good surf. Oh my surf. god! Some yeah, of yeah. the wave. I mean, so it was like, actually, that that going back to Chris Hines, I think tipped the tip the BBC off that would be a good character. Because, oh, did he? Uh, yeah. So it was a lot of thanks to Chris Hines for the tip off, and they like they picked up basically the series was with the BBC. They picked, uh, you know, a boxer from London and a surf from the northeast and like four or five little teenage kids. And you had a camera for about a year, six months or a year. Yeah. Um, this is you're talking about cameras like the size. Oh, of a the, big old thing. <laughs> two two shoe boxes yeah. put together. Like yeah. they weren't the little mini cams you got now. They weren't those iPhone clips. They're like big cassettes and like all these cameras. And they train you up, train you up a little bit how to use a camera. Yeah. And away you go. And you'd send back the tapes every week, like oh, boxes brilliant. and boxes of tapes, like hundreds of hours of tapes. Wow. And then some like poor guy or girls, the editor, <laughs> put it down into the story. But basically it was at a real crux time of those teenage years. You just learned to drive, you're off surfing on your first surf trip, my older brother's away. Uh, you know, you're driving away, you're doing your exams. Um, one of the key moments was going down to Cornell, um, I've got a feeling actually, or maybe a touch in because I feel like, oh, it must have been the juniors. And so I went out of the corner for like the English Junior Championships or whatever. Went down, the, won the trophy. Yeah, yeah. The English or the British? I think One it might them. have been, the, well, I got here, I think it was the British juniors. Yeah. Was it the British so juniors? Went down to the UK, smashed, smashed the Cornish. You did? Come home happy, boom. Absolutely. <laughs> but that was like such big moments when you're a teenager and you know, you look up to Spencer and Russell and he's safe, isn't it? Absolutely incredible surfers, and that whole crew, all these incredible surfers in Newquay, like the hub of the surfing world in the in the UK, mm. and one of the high points of like European surfing. And so to go down there, and to get that moment, like you went down, took the trophy, won it, boom, and you're out. And then it ended. We all, we drove off to France on our adventure. It was really pretty cool. <laughs> it was because like, I watched that film as a kid, and I've watched it again recently, and it did actually send like the hairs on the back of my neck on end because like it was that thing you 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 kind of sent it to the guys down there didn't you and then at the end of the program you're holding the, the championship up the, the, the cap up like that and then off you go and you and then actually you you recite the locations that you're dreaming of going or oh, maybe not even right, dreaming because yeah. you probably didn't end up going there anyway but um was that like a major kickstarter to you like you because you went pro then didn't you yeah pretty much probably from like 18 it was like quicksilver's like first paycheck came in and it was a choice like do you go to university and then like, yeah got a paycheck like i'm going to hawaii and like <laughs> spencer was there and i was like i'm coming to hawaii <laughs> And you'd stretch that money as long as long as you'd stretch as far as far as you could. Just like rice and beans for like three months. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to buy boards. That's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. just going to not eat anything for months. And um, and that was it, really. Yeah. And it was not that I was ever like the most comfortable competitor. It was more. I think I think of it now, and I look back at it and go, well, even when I'm looking around, like the kids in, who are surfing now these days, I'm like, you're almost. A sense that it's your surfing at that time. You almost have to prove you're going through that process of the competition to prove to yourself you're a good surfer. Yeah. Probably you don't actually maybe need to go through that. Yeah. And I think the kids now, I'm like, would I say my little son? I'm like, would I, would you push not push him, but would you like encourage him to go through this competition thing? And I'm like, probably not, because it's kind of like pretty painful at highs and lows. But at the time, and also probably for a lot of the kids now, that's the path you have to take. It's like you get your sponsorship. You go down the corner, you get the trophy, you get your thing, you go on tour to Europe, you go into the Europeans as far as you can go, you do the British teams, you go to the EPSA tour, then you go down to Portugal, and you're trying, like, that was the route you had to do to get your sponsors to keep the sort of wheels in motion. Yeah. Whereas now, I feel like I'd try and encourage kids now to say, like, there's probably an alternative path where you don't have to do the competitions, you don't have to prove to anyone you're a good surfer, they're sort of... You could be an awesome surf activist without yeah. being the best aerial surfer out there. But there is the competition path and there's the Olympic path. Uh, and when you're in Hossego, you see the Hossego Surf Club and they've got 30 or yeah. kids out there just shredding. Mm. But there's an alternative life to make a living out surfing, so I'd say. For, for you, would you say that, I know you said you didn't feel that perhaps that comfortable in the jersey, but was it your plan to make it in the jersey or was it a means to an end to that kind of free surfing lifestyle I think when going back then things. yeah there wasn't really free surfing I think no. that was the thing there was no free surfing but then it was like you, stickers and contests and yeah. that was that way wasn't it yeah I, I, correct me if I'm wrong but there, there seemed to I, there seemed to be a perhaps more opportunity to compete um, through the European tour I know it was 
it was a bigger thing back then, wasn't it? Perhaps because there was only that avenue. Yeah. Nowadays, people yeah. can kind of branch off into different things. The the film Blue Horizon really was the that kind of shift change, I think, wasn't it? Because you had the comparison between Andy Irons and Dave Rastovich, and it's like, Dave Rastovich is a free surfer. Mm. Yeah, and Andy's and, and just and like, like, oh, competitive I, can be a, I, can be a, I can be a free surfer, what? Yeah, and it was almost like, there was probably like certain people pulled it off and like the Machado like leaned off. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, boom, he's out. Or yeah, Rast is an awesome example. Or, you know, some of the surfers. But even, or even like Dane Reynolds, you know, they still, he's never the natural competitor. He's gone through the process mm-hmm. of like, got to prove myself that I am like top 10, top world class mm-hmm. surfer. But then he's like, Phew. He's a great example. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard interviews with him where he's he said that he used to go to the NSSAs and would purposefully lose so he could go and surf back home because he knew the <laughs> surf. Yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it was an interesting path and there's lots of different ways to, to sort of... I think for me it was just like I wanted to surf and that was like the answer to... Like I was fully committed to being in the ocean that was it. That Abs- was the way. Absolutely. And just quickly, just keeping that competitive, like, sort of uh, theme alive, I just, as you know, we're all Welsh-based here. We're all <laughs> Welsh. So I just wondered, just, and this is just purely for my own... Uh, it's, uh, I wonder whether you remember competing in the Welsh juniors with uh, a couple of the names from back in the day. From There's obviously the likes of Greg Owen, Vaughny, and then... Uh, nah, they mean nothing to me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Level, do you remember Paul Level? Oh, of course, Paul yeah. Paul a great surfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Neck and neck on load. Yeah. Honestly, I've got, like... Greg, well, all of you crew, like, well, to be honest, I had a super tight connection with the Wave Graffiti Boys. Yes, I was of like, course you my was... dream, as a little kid, I was like, second skin wetsuit, yes. with the best wetsuit, Wave Graffiti Board, yeah, with yeah. the best board. So yeah. I was like, I, thought I was sorted out the house, and I saw my original letter to like Chris and John at Wave Graffiti. No way. My original, like, dear, I'm a 14 year old server from Time Out, and like Whoa. this, like, long letter, and it's like, and those guys were so supportive. Yeah, so amazing. supportive. So there's this like connection I've had with, you know, I've, I've not been back there recently, but yeah, but with the Wave Graffiti crew, and then my dad was off, my folks are there, but then once you're doing the British event, or or we'd come to surf on your ways, it's like yeah, there's Greg, who's an awesome surfer, Vaughny, his brother, um, Nathan. Nathan, like Nathan was part of the Quicksilver team. We, we did a lot yeah. of trips with Nathan. Yeah, um, it's really cool. Like it's such high standard. Always good fun, mm. which I think, you know, like I said, the best if have no fun were literally like you guys were ripping and having fun, and it's like wherever you went, like the party went with you. But when it came down to the waves, it's like the waves are actually really important. Mm. And then there's still now, there's like occasions when those guys would come up to say with us, and we have a really good time. It's like a super mutual respect. Mm. And, and um, yeah, I love, love surfing with, those, with all that crew. Good times indeed. Good times. You, you mentioned uh, about Nathan being part of the Quicksilver team there, and of course Quicksilver was an enormous part of your surfing career. But how important was that? Uh, was Quicksilver as an organisation in facilitating your career? Well, yeah, the same thing. Probably like I was saying, like Wave Graffiti and with the boards that when I was a kid I wanted to ride. Then the next step up from that was like, well, what if you can have one sticker on your board? Who would it be? And it'd be, it'd be that Quicksilver stick on the nose of the board. Yeah. And I was like super like proud moment to be part of that company for so long and I was right involved when in France it was literally like Pierre and Peo and Marichu and they were packing boxes and probably a warehouse probably like the size of this tent or thereabouts yeah. mm. so that's how it started so you were in there right at the ideas with Spencer and, and that you were group. in there that was the family wasn't it like, and it felt yeah. like a family and, yeah. and then there's Hackman and these yeah. awesome people and Harry Hodge these awesome awesome people who were the founders they come over from Australia and America and Start the European thing, and at the time, so Quicksilver's bubbling, and Billabong is bubbling, mm-hmm. and Rip Curl's bubbling, and then they grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. That's all like good news, and you'd never like, you know, that's the hand that feeds you. It's awesome. That's why we kind of moved to Southwest France to be within that zone. But then you look at where it is now, and and I feel like a lot of that's lost. And I think the people within that probably also see that. But what I find frustrating about those companies now is they they're not taking any leaders on sustainability at all. They're like barely barely coming in that direction at all right yeah and to me that's like a big miss for those guys and for the surfing world because to me those guys should be like leading the way leading the way like yeah, okay, it's sure. going to cost you a bit of your margin but you should be having the most you know you should be having you've got 100 wetsuits on your wetsuit line you should have one one sustainable wetsuit made out of natural rubber like you've got 100 suits one should be should have a ulex one in there uh, yeah it can be i mean again i don't want to get too like 
hit up on like wetsuits and this and that but like the other frustrating thing about some of those brands is the way they're spinning it that they are going green or eco yeah it's like greenwashing um, it's, that's the problem to me is like if you're not going to do a sustainable suit or you're not going to talk about it fair enough but don't then come in and say limestone's like a green neoprene because it's not okay there's nothing like green or eco about limestone so to me in the industry that's a total mess mm -hmm. so it's like tidying up that is important to me and i've got to the point now like you know whether it was with Pago or not i'd probably call people out on that now because it's getting it's too much at stake i think now yeah. the world's freaking in meltdown we've got so many years to change the world or our kids aren't going to see the world that we saw yeah um and as and then you go back to that first thing of like surfing this counterculture this like bunch of radical people doing cool stuff that's why we fell in love with the sport and if the leaders of the sport aren't going in that direction probably call them out on it mm -hmm. because and and then also celebrate the guys that are doing yeah, right for sure. Tom from Finisterre yeah. you know, they've gone 100 and you like boom mm. some of those smaller startups or you know the basic super basic thing like is it recycled is it organic right. cotton like this basic stuff is it, like it must be so together. so frustrating for the the companies that are bothering to do this and make the changes that are necessary that it has the potential to be a real positive and perhaps help sales i think the mindset is especially in the younger generations is changing in that way so it must be really frustrating to see these the big dogs of the surf world try and kind of piggyback on it without actually making yeah, those changes that's like like there's just basic things where it's like there's there's proven like products be it what well, organic cotton whatever recycled whatever you want to call it there's there's examples of every product you want and how how best can you make that mm -hmm. product that we all use every day and, mm -hmm. and we're going to buy it there's 10 products on the shelves and then you can make the choice i want this one this one i'll pay a little bit more i'll get that this that and the other so it's like the answers are out there and you, we really need those big brands to step up and change their game. Absolutely. Now, I just want to sort of go back off, <laughs> sort of tone it back, not tone it down at all, because I think it's certainly uh, worth talking about. But the I want to talk about your sort of Quicksilver journey, <coughs> because I think it's something which not very many people get to hear about. Like, you were well, you were on the Indies Trader, which was at the, the Martin Daly was the skipper, back in the very early days. Like... Can you just tell us a little bit about so, it, really? So, again, I, I was probably a few years after. Martin Daly, for those that wouldn't know, um, everyone's seen the pictures of Mentor Wise. There was phenomenal, all the photos and of all the surf ads I've ever seen, all the best Indonesian footage, often come from the Mentor Islands, where Martin Daly went up on his, I think it was an old salvage boat, uh, like, like salvage vessel, like an, quite a sort of ruggedy old, like, it's not a luxury cruiser, it's mm. like a functional like reconditioned fishing boat for salvaging whatever off the sea floor martin sailed around the mentor wise discovered all of the world's best surf breaks pretty much mm. for many many years and then he started doing boat chars and then the pros started coming and then the pros started coming and then all the industry piggybacks on the back of that and um at that point quicksilver were like martin's the guy they rebranded the whole boat and they repainted the whole boat and send it off around the world it actually there was like an environmental message to it at that point. So on one hand, I'm saying like they're doing terribly. On the other hand, this was a pretty cool project. It's like they were basically going around a lot of the unexplored reefs, a looking for surf, yeah, but also um, with science based like doing like surveys of quality of reef life, so yeah. you can go down. With, and so when I I joined them in um, Solomon Islands, which it, I was like, I got, I, in fact, I was in. Orkney Islands with my dad and they're like the phone rings hey Gabe where are you oh yeah what are you doing hey do you want to go to the Solomon Islands I'm, I'm like Solomon Islands yeah yeah but I'm like yeah yeah definitely want to go there I'm like no idea where that is <laughs> yeah yeah but definitely yeah I'll be there what day yeah I'll be there I'm like where's the Solomon Islands <laughs> I'm in the Orkney I'm just like I'm in, the, I'm in the, I thought these islands are far away yeah yeah <laughs> I'm like these islands are far as I've ever been God, it's like so we're off the Solomon Islands I'm like okay we're off wow. the Solomon Islands how do we get there I have no idea so we're actually like so it sits like close to Papua New Was Guinea. Was a direct flight from Newcastle? <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy jet. It's a Ryanair, I'm coming. <laughs> Ryanair. <laughs> so we got picked up in the Solomon Islands on the Indies Trader with this phenomenal paint. And I was on the trip with, I think it was Pete Mel. Oh God, who was it? Photographer's Nabe. Strider was on the boat. Um, 
Was it Mickey Peacock, maybe? I can't, I don't know. I'm getting names wrong. But it was definitely Pete Mel. Anyway, there's a crew of like some internationals. There's basically a couple of Europeans, a couple of Americans, a couple of Australians. And away you go, you're up to the Southern Islands. You get off at, you arrive at this port, you sail around, and you get off at this port here. No one knows where we're going. The waves were phenomenal. Were they? Just phenomenal. Untouched as well? I think there was like a little outpost from like secret spot, like on these conditions, some Australians would fly up to surf okay. there on like special conditions to this one spot. Yeah. Because it was like accessible. Yeah. But then there was the whole like, you're going from A to B, so many hundred nautical miles, you're going to get what you get. So on this ship, sailing around, and you'd come into some ports, and the basically wall canoes would come out. Wow. Dudes with uh, nose bones. Mm hmm fully war painted up really and you're like and they thought we were like Japanese um, like industrial fishermen like dynamite in the reefs no or overfishing the reefs so yeah. they were coming into like attack mode no way and we were like whoa, whoa no we're surfing and you had to explain them no we're actually surfing we're not fishing you're... and they're like no these are reefs going crazy and then oh what's surfing and then you just watch surfing like, oh my god right okay you're not, like give you're not give you're not taking anything away yeah, yeah. you're like giving like and whatever you're giving you know it's like a no yeah. takes situation it's a thing, really, isn't yeah it? but then and then we got you know they invite us into the port and you go into these tribal tents with thousands of skulls everywhere and it's like phenomenal like crazy Gosh, world was this the last surf trip that came through it was pretty <laughs> awesome <laughs> like, it was, so that was like one of the total high points of that whole time at quicksilver was, was it really like, that sounds you know, incredible like, we'd go diving so again because it's savage everyone's you know you got all the tanks up and they were like We'd anchor up, and there'd be the surf spot over here, and you'd paddle across the channel at the surf spot. And Martin goes, oh, do you want to go diving? Or the, Martin was on the, wasn't on the boat, I think it was on the other skip. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's like, have you done diving before? Like, Never done diving before, but hey, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. So we went and put scuba tanks on, we went down the anchor chain to the bottom of the boat, you know, this harbour. And bearing in mind the waves, like 200 metres over there, you paddle across the channel. got down the bottom of the anchor chain, you look around, and there's just like hundreds of sharks. Oh wow, hundred! And you're like, literally, I'm watching my mates like paddling across from boat to reef no way. in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Wow! And I'm like, I had no idea the situation <laughs> we were in. Don't panic, Mr. Manoring. <laughs> Don't panic. Oh and so we went. We did two dives, and it was just shark infested water, but also phenomenally like healthy water. There's yeah. fish everywhere. There's tuna. Wow. There's tuna the size of cars. So it was like suddenly you're like actually. It's Probably healthy me, yeah. ecosystem. They're not that bothered. Yeah, but that was like a pretty cool, like indie trader story. That's back in the day. that is cool. Based on that story, I'm I'm more or less certain of how you're going to answer this question. But has surf travel changed <laughs> for you in the last two years? <laughs> <laughs> Came here. Yeah, it's my right. first trip out. We're in Bristol. <laughs> right, so we, we, well. we could. It feels like the sound does it? Doesn't yeah. I think honestly, I think yeah. In all seriousness, I'd say okay. This. Two years aside, like the world's changed, but it was going to change anyway, pandemic or not. And I think the biggest hit or miss from my side, or the biggest question mark, was probably flying. Right, yeah. Because the carbon footprint footprint associated with flying is immense. It's massive, and it's we've got to ask ourselves: okay, we're surfers, we're very fortunate, we live by the coast, we argue about what fins to ride, like whatever. It's like we're super lucky to be where we are in the world. Um, but, and we all, you know, generally quite selfish. Oh, I'm on the best ways by myself over here. And, you know, we've got the surface generally have a massive carbon footprint. Don't we? We'll fly over, yeah, we're going to fly over yeah. here, we're going to fly over there, we're going to chase the waves and we're going to swell this. Da, 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 da. So, I, but I think now we really would question, like, how many flights you're going to get and which ones you're going to get. Um, that's my one biggest thing I would bet. But then you also want to show, you know, family that, like, I want to show my little son these amazing places mm. you've yeah. been or, go to experience those amazing coral reefs or go to Hawaii because the waves are the world's best waves and meet people but then I'd do it very thoughtfully like I wouldn't just jump on planes like I did when I was uh, willy nilly yeah, yeah. 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 Very cautious. You, you mentioned the, the pandemic and I, I think the the past two years has really kind of opened people's eyes to what's on our doorstep yes and Ryan you've been up to the Orkneys this, this summer the Hebrides yeah oh, the Hebrides I yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I know lots of people have been taking staycations and, and, and exploring places within drivable distance but we're blessed that we you know we can drive to anywhere in Europe and Europe yeah. is like I mean I'm biased for sure but for my money 
there's nowhere I'd rather spend my time. Like if if in Europe, prime, like oh, we're sitting in October now, it's prime time, isn't it? Like mm. Prime time in Europe. If you could jump in a car or plane once upon a time, and fly doo -doo 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 between Ireland, Scotland, Portugal, maybe borrow Morocco. Mm. You don't need to go anywhere else, do you? Mm. If you want the world's biggest waves, you go to Nazareth. You want the world's hollowest waves, you go to where well, you know Canaries or France or whatever. Like we've got phenomenal waves in the UK. If you're flexing up to be out there on the right time, you've got there. So like we've got those waves like, exactly like you say. Like you don't your adventure can be on the doorstep, mm -hmm. and it can be local and it can be like really radical, as radical as you want it to be. So yeah, I'd, and actually with the Patagonia, like our ambassadors. We are, I mean, our European guys, I am sort of challenging them to say, like, well, you've been, you know, there's been not much restricted travel anyway because of restrictions, but I kind of want, I don't want you to fly off to Mexico or South Africa anymore. I want you to be in yeah. Europe doing your thing, doing like low carbon, low impact trips because we can do that. We're so fortunate. You've got Mandaka down the road, you've got Lofford and up the road. Mm. Like, they're all there, mm. should you want them. And I, I, I mean, Again, I'm just jumping a little bit about here. <laughs> it's just away from that. But um, this is going back to the 90s, okay? So you, you, you've you made your self-made documentary. And uh, this one... It's on VHS. Yeah, it is. Somewhere. <laughs> but this one I also remember. You you were actually on a show on Channel 4 that you presented called Surf Trip with Tess Daly. Well, without me, she'd be nowhere. Would she, she? Where would she be right she now? She wouldn't be on Dancing with Ice, whatever. Well, well, <laughs> Dancing with Ice. How did that Dancing come with Rice. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? How did that, that come about? One. Can you tell me about oh, that a little bit? It always comes back to Wales, doesn't it? We you not? Always. <laughs> so the story with that one, it was a Welsh production company. What's guys it? Guys called from Boomerang. Who I, I know think, them. Um, Julius, is it? Yeah, Julius. Um, Hugh, Gareth. Yeah. I think, the, well, at the time they were Cardiff-based. Um, they often had a slot, like a Sunday morning slot. Like They did a lot of stuff at S4C, so it's a lot of Welsh language TV. Yeah. They were a big production company. And then, but because of that, they had connection with Channel 4, and Channel 4 was like, we need to fill 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. And they pitched it, boom, we're going to do a 10-part surf series. I'm like... Got the call. It's going to be the presenter. Yes, yes obviously. Please. I'll do that. That's awesome. And they're like, what should we do? I'm like, we should go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Forget what I just said about yeah. flying. Yeah. We should go to the Mentuais. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to France. We're definitely going to Portugal. We're definitely going to the Canaries. And I'm like, is that 10 yet? Uh, okay, I've got a couple more spares. <laughs> and, it's like, and you almost like scripted like um, Ireland we did. And some of it was like world tour stuff, and it was a great chance to bring in like sponsors. It was like the Quicksilver Masters in uh, Bundoran and in oh, yeah. Hossegor, and because um, that's one at um, Kong surfing yeah, like, boardies. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was like all of these, and then the big we went to Maldives and the, well, the Mentorize with my sponsor Bic had like a a one design contest where everyone rode the same Gosh, board, yeah, no the same, the same yeah. like longboard contest. Wow, that's cool. So you all surf the same board in the same waves. Um, so we went to film that. So we did all of these trips, which were kind of cool. Well, I was just like, this is awesome, like getting paid to go on surf trips. Of course. And then Tess Daly got called in to like be the skilled person on the job because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> She's like, yes, I get to go on surf trips. <laughs> but that was... <laughs> in the end, she almost didn't. She only turned up for a few, but she was like... I was literally her like... I'm not saying that made her. I didn't <laughs> make her. I'm responsible. But that was one of her very early like Channel well, Four it? moments. Yeah. Well done, Gay. This is your pitch. Thank this you, is your yeah. pitch for next year's Strictly. <laughs> one <laughs> one day I'll be on the ballroom <laughs> dancing. Russ, just... Russ Winter got on Question of Sport once, didn't he? Did he? Yeah. <laughs> Gabe on uh, Strictly next Carl year. Carlin got on Jonathan Ross. Did, did he? Yeah. Yeah. Seen yeah. He I just didn't know that. I I'm dressed in some like full like retro like quicksilver like in matching. the crowd or being interviewed. By <laughs> full interviewed, and he was like, and I'm sure Jonathan Ross just took the piss from Lemon. Yeah. Oh wow. Colin was, he was the classic. Oh, you were a surfer. Oh, uh, yeah, like, I can imagine Jonathan that, yeah. Ross. Yeah. Okay, and um, we're gonna flip back again. We've had our '90s talk and reminisced, but earlier on you mentioned about having big waves on our doorstep here in Europe. So we're going to talk about your big wave exploits, if you don't mind. And when and how did you come to realise that you're going to start to take a, an interest in big surf? Had it been something that you'd been thinking about, or did it come naturally? So I'll probably going yeah back to the first quicksilver like paycheck. It's like you're a teenager, 
You've got to check mm. what you're going to do with it. Mm. And it was almost like too competition wise. I'm like, mm-hmm. forget that. We're going to Hawaii. Biggest wave in the world. We're going to Hawaii. <laughs> we're going there. That's yeah. where the action is. We're going there. Brilliant. And then from there, you look at Hawaii. Like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. oh, these are waves. <laughs> and these are surfers. And then we are way out of our depth. So then it was like, you go in there with this like intrepidation of utter fear. Like, we get off the plane. You're like, oh my God. This is terrifying riding on massive boards and like certainly scary waves and all the crazy like historical egos of the community and the icons and pipe masters and big wave surfers and legends and shapers and it's just a different world but I just it was addictive and I kept going back every winter the minute I got like a winter trip it was like bang I'm going away going away going away and that was my thing versus go, the alternative would have been you go to like D-Bar in Australia and fine tune your small wave equipment so yeah. you come back honed for the competition circuit I was like yeah. forget the contest I would go and dive in the deep end and then one of the one of those trips it's so tricky to remember what year that was, but um, it was like the Derek Dawn uh, and very, very early toe surfing when they're surfing behind a Zodiac mm. on the like yeah. seven sixes and with Buzzy Kilbacks. Yeah, Buzzy Kilbacks, all yeah. that crew and the surfing outside sunset. And we were on the beach going, Oh my god, what is going on here these days? You wouldn't normally surf, and you're suddenly seeing this guy surfing. Wow, that's ing- interesting. And then fast forward out of Hawaii, we met the Malloy brothers, we had a really good connection with those guys um, via Hawaii. And the Irish crew, like Richie Fitzgerald and Bundoran, who, who came with us on a lot of those trips, Lee Barlow's came with us yeah. on a lot of those trips. And so there's this like American Irish connection, and then they flipped it back and they came back to Ireland on many trips. Um, That's right. uh, Thicker Than Water was the film, and um, Litmus, wasn't it? Litmus was yeah. to go. So some of those films, they started coming to Ireland, but the one that really won it was when we saw me and Richie were on the cliff watching the Malloy's toe surfing Mullock Moor. And we sat on the beach going, in Mullock Moor was this like unridden, I think it might have been ridden a little bit, a small size, but mm. generally mm-hmm. it, was like, it was like the phantom wave. Yeah. I'm sure every, every community's got a phantom wave that breaks like out in the distance. Oh, mm. that's a day of broken, big Wednesday of whenever. And Mullock Moor was like this phantom wave. And, um, we sat there watching the Malloy surfing and they'd got and they were toe surfing like just on normal boards but they'd hired a skate because they were part of a big film production yeah and we were like fuck they're surfing our waves not that they're my waves but I've been in Ireland yeah. a lot and, and Richie think, was there watching yeah it's like we've well, done all of that pioneering of that north coast around Bondor and like the early days with those guys and I was like oh my god they're surfing those waves we should probably be surfing those waves yeah but they were too big and too scary we didn't yeah. know how to do it so then I went back to Hawaii that following winter and then I fought, saw the first like tow board in a right. surf shop like hand me down board from one of the guys okay. I'm like that's coming home so uh-huh. like, Richie I've got a tow board uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm like now we just need a jet ski <laughs> oh my god we need a jet ski and then a tow rope and then a what do we do next yeah. <laughs> I've got the board though <laughs> And I'm like, are you in? He's like, of course I'm in. I'm like, so off we go. We're like, we're toe surfing in Europe. And um, <laughs> it was just starting the early days of Bell, Harrow and Lenore, mm. like the very early French surfers. Mm-hmm. Just starting. And we were just starting in like Northwest Ireland. And we had the most dodgy jet ski. Oh, really? Was, like <laughs> super cowboy jet ski. And the one thing you need that's good is a good jet ski. The board's kind of, in hindsight, we could have just had our normal boards. Yeah. You know, with foot straps on. So but you need a good jet ski, but we had a bad jet ski. We had the tow rope was too long. Oh, no. The board was too long. The board was too narrow. All of these things, but no one's telling you what to do. Yeah. You're literally doing it on your own. Yeah, you you're feeling it out as you go. Yeah. And you're yeah, like, yeah. the two of us in the water, no support, no nothing. Nothing. So we did that for a couple of seasons and it was so cowboy, but we got a few moments. And I'm like, we're going on the biggest, stormiest day of the year, we're going out. And he's like, this is good. <laughs> this is silly. We never called the RNI. That was the one thing we never did was call the RNI. We swam, there's one time we swam the jet ski in like two miles. Oh, God. And I am tell. not calling well, one of my, the lifeboat. One of, growing up, one of my dad's first bits of advice to me on surfing was never get rescued. He was like, swim to Minehead before you get rescued. He's like, he's like, whatever you do, don't put your hand up. Yeah. Like, okay, if you miss mine head, <laughs> yeah. I get to Ross yeah. Laird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And only then. Exactly. So you you said, you mentioned then about making the conscious decision to go to Hawaii rather than perhaps D-Bar to fine-tune your kind of small wave surfing. But how does uh, the kind of the big wave scene compare to 
those accolades that winning the British and, and any other kind of big contest successes that you've had? I think probably at this time I'd probably like I'd almost like been through the mill of the, the national circuit, the European circuit. And it comes with highs and lows, like you place in this contest, you don't in that contest. And then that time I'd spent up in, in Northwest Ireland, I was just fully connected with that zone as well because there's a lot of phenomenal left handers up there. Mm. And um, suddenly, and also at the time, working really well with surf photographers like Alex Williams and some of the magazines, so the surf photographers were getting a bit more out and about, so it, you, there was kind of that free mm -hmm. surfing vibe. And I knew like I'd probably have more value because well, we lived in Hossegor at the time, so it was like, I'll be placing in the top 10 or the top 30 of the European mm -hmm. event, and you're just going down the range, like, oh, there's Gabe there with the Quicksilver stick on, but mine was like the top 10 are all Quicksilver kids, and they're all yeah. awesome. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I did really well, I got through to the quarters. Yeah. Or do you go to Ireland with Alex Williams or some phenomenal photographer and get like six door pages in the magazine? And at the end of the year, you go back to your contract and you say, like, look, I got all these pages and the cover shot and this and that, and the images, the images become more valuable than the result yes on, indeed on paper yeah yeah and it, it was on that north coast of, or northwest coast of ireland that you surfed the wave that won the xxl nomination right? yeah yeah so we were out a big day uh it was 2009 it was, was that you and richie yeah, yeah there was a few of us out that day um but we'd built up to that moment and we were doing a really big uh film feature documentary called wave riders so um that was my wife had written the film uh uh, director Joel Conroy um, and a producer Margot Harkin from Belfast and Dublin had got the finance around the film and they got really big budget financing for the film um, so it became a really big production and it was all shot on film so now you imagine all these digital cameras so this is shot on reels and reels yeah, of film so it's a very expensive, expensive. Yeah. but the director's like I wanted to look stunning and beautiful and there's a lot of cross-border funding between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland at the time so that was a, there was an availability of funds that were there that maybe aren't there now so we'd sort of proven ourselves early days. We'd find tuning equipment, we've got new jet skis, we'd tone, you know, we'd fine tune everything. So this is a few years into our tow serve next year. A few of the crews would come on board, like Almini and Cotty and Duncan Scott and probably lots of other people I can't think of. And some of them, the Malloys kept coming back. And, and um, that particular session was at the end of this shooting period. We'd basically been shooting and we had... Um, probably about three or four months. No, we've been shooting longer than that. We've been shooting almost a year, I believe. And we'd had a big session at Aileen's, a big right hander on the cliff. Underneath the cliffs, so, yeah. And that at that point, that was the biggest session we had. That was going to be the finale. When I ended up big save, and I'm like, no, no, let's hold out, let's hold out. And we pushed it all the way back to, I think it's like 1st of December is the cut off because they got to finish the edit and it's going to get in a film festival in February or something. Mm -hmm. So we had like the finished day of shooting was the 1st of December, end of story. And that was it. And you, we were, and I'll wait for a while, we'll wait for a while, we'll wait for a while. And now we're on the phone going, like, end of November, look, end, it's not happening. I'm going to cancel everyone's, like, you know, just set everyone free because yeah. they're all on hold, like, oh, wait for a while. Um, I'm like, no, 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 hold off, hold off, hold off. There's something on the long range chart. Really? And they're like, no, 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 no. I'm like, hold off. There's a moment out there that's going to be better than aliens that we just haven't got it yet. There's wow. the potential there, but we haven't got it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, right, the last day is the 1st of December, that's it. I'm like, okay, that's fair enough. And then, sure enough, it was like the the storm of, like, the te the decade, basically, yeah. came through. No way. And I'm like, and at the, t at the time now, the guy's surfing now at low tide. At the time, we were surfing at generally higher tide because it was a bit safer. Now they surf at low tide, and it's super dredge. And they paddle it. We just use it. It's not a well, it's like yeah, yeah. proper cowards compared to what they, the guys are doing now. But basically, at the time, it was like high tide in the morning. We had from like dawn till about midday, be light off shores, and the tide would drop out. And then by midday, this like hurricane wind would hit, and the storm would hit mm. on the last day of the shoot, possible full stop. Wow. No way. And I'm like, we're going on that day, like <laughs> it's all on. And so we were like, we were just, like the Malloys, right? We said, guys, you've got to come for this one, you've got to come for this one. This is this one, this is the one we've been waiting for. So we're like Keith and Dan and Chris, because they knew the potential that this bay, Mullet Moor, could hold a 100 foot wave. It'll never close out. Mm -hmm. It's the wave that we've been looking for. And, you know, it's like they're, they're all goofy footers. They want to surf like, it's like the Jaws, left hand version of Jaws, yeah. as we know it is now. But at the time, they knew it, the potential, but no one had really seen it. Yeah, yeah. So like, this is death, swell of the decade arrives. 
and uh, yeah, like Mickey Smith jumped off the rocks on a bodyboard to shoot the stills, and the cameraman was in a, a boat that we hired, and we had a jet ski, and I think it was Mimi, uh, Dylan Scott, I, was like, I don't want to, I don't want to get miss people out, but um, anyway, so we there's a little two or three crews went out, and sure enough, it was like the day of days. On, and we were on the cliff going, oh my God, it's the biggest we've ever seen it. We were terrified. And there's no scale in the water because no one's in the water. Because you can't, yeah, of course. It, but on the charts, you know it's the biggest of the big. We're going in. We're going in. And then the film crew's all there. You, I was going to say. BBC Health and Safety. you got to go. BBC Health and Safety is like, we're going to get some lifeguards on the cliff. Yeah, I'm like, that's completely pointless, isn't it? What are they going to do? Throw a ladder down? They'll come down. Yeah. I'm like, don't put them anywhere near the cliff. They're more danger to themselves than they are to yeah. us. You know, it was like, so we've got, and sure enough, that became like the sort of like, it was just, as forecast, the wind hit in midday, boom, and it was blown out to pieces, and the storm hit, and that was it, gone. But we've got this, like, one moment, we got the session, and that became the end of the film, and that got the nomination for the. XXL award alongside like Mavericks yeah, and what an achievement Jaws was and it so was it is the are those accolades shared between driver and surfer I think I think it was almost just for the day I think yeah. it was more just like okay. these this session got nominated ah, like, I see. and a couple of the waves got nominated okay. and um, yeah we actually we were in California for that nomination but yeah it's a funny story actually yeah we were in, and it's this massive like black tie event in Orange County. Yeah. Like they sell all the seats and the tables oh, for like thousand right. dollars, and there's like five hundred people in there, and all the pro servers rock up in there, stretching them out. Oh no way! <laughs> full like <laughs> car volume, literally full that's on what Hollywood. It is. That's literally what it is. And I like phone my, my team manager, my quick team manager. Like, oh, can me and Lauren come and get a table at the thing because we're up for a nomination? He's like, no, we've we've our tables like full. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I've got I'm like what? But I'm nominated. These like kids are here from like traveling, doing like the competitions. I'm like, dude, I've got a nomination. I'm like, oh no, sorry. No way. So I phoned Kelly, who's obviously a really good friend as well. Yeah. Like, Kelly, we're nominated, and we got an invite. Behind, we got a table to sit. He's like, oh, you can come and sit on my table. You can come and sit on my no table. No way. So we're like sitting on, the, on his chair, like <laughs> squeeze seat. up. So, yeah, squeeze <laughs> up a bit, struggle up a bit. <laughs> And we've got really good friends like Pat O'Connell, who was really connected with Hurley and Hurley and Bob Hurley, who's a super nice guy. And so we were sitting with Pat and and um, Kelly, and we we're all <laughs> budged up on the little table, like stealing their wine and their like little canapes and stuff. And sure enough, the film, well, the the session, the film got of the film got nominated for like, best film and um, the session for like best wave or whatever. And as we walked up. Like Bob Hurley's coming with massive hugs, oh, like no you guys way. were awesome. That was the best thing, and everyone's high fiving us. And the like Euro like quicks on the table, just like <laughs> zero just waving across to them. Guys. Hi, guys. I'm like, dude, like you missed a trick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? That nah, pretty much summed up the situation. Fantastic. Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow. I, like that, that like the the whole big wave scene is obviously a lot different. It's a, it's a different animal uh, to like regular surfing those like milestones that you you know like out at Malik Moor there it's really important to celebrate like what those big wave surfers are achieving isn't it I mean like right now like I listened to a podcast with Carty earlier and like just what like he's throwing into training like it's 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 a real full time job isn't it it's massive the I'm kind of re- feel really lucky that I was there for Mullock Moor. Yeah. That to me was a, a phenomenally beautiful wave. It's perfect. It's got a channel. It's got, a, you know, it's dangerous. It's got a rock ledge. It's enormous. But it's also perfect and it's got a safety round it. It's got like channel on yeah. three sides. It's got a nice easy launch. It's got a cliff top. And you feel comfortable in the waves and it's like our like climate that we used to, like mm-hmm. northern, you know, northeast Wales. Like here in the same way, to the same gear, a few hours from home. Mm. It's a world we know really well, yeah. but it's like the dream wave just magnified yeah. to whatever size you're lucky enough to get. And then, for me personally, it was like a tricky time because we were well, starting a family, and you know things sort of change, careers change a touch. Like you sort of pull out of one brand and you move to another direction, and we're starting a family. So it's a difficult time. That made me like pull out, pull away from that a little bit. Right. Okay. And, but someone like Cotty, yeah, 
those crew moved on to Nazare, which yes. to me is like, I look at that wave and I go, it's really peaky, it's really shifty, there's a load of closeouts, there's a dangerous cliff, there's a shore break that you would never want to be seen near a hundred miles off. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I'm so glad that you did it when you that did was, uh, my wave was like, I thought my wave was like more like one. I, I love those waves in Hawaii and yeah. I love all the different waves around the world, but Nazare to me is a hat off to all the guys and girls and some of the like Justine, some of the girls out there. Yeah. Phenomenal. So it's not just guys, it's girls. Full spectrum of people, yeah, they... international travel. You know, when the Hawaiians are coming to save your waves, and they are like terrified yeah. to their core. You wow. know, it's a real wave. You know, it's um, you, you you've touched upon it there, but do you fancy uh, picking up the rope again? I think with more and more, I would say if it again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like okay. I've got, I've got, I've got a beautiful like nine six board that is unwaxed from uh, a time I broke my leg really, really badly on a when my wife was pregnant, which kind of killed things for a year. But before that, I got this beautiful, like, Fletcher Schoenard kind of stunning big wave board, which okay. probably could be ridden again, should be ridden again, and I should probably ride it again. And you, you've mentioned about starting a family, and family life and parenthood has perhaps affected your, your outlook on surfing. Uh, how has it shifted the goalposts for you? Yeah, right now I love so much surfing the little boy. He's seven and a half. Um, he's the cutest little kid in the sea and um that's that's this next phase isn't it like i'll be just as happy swimming and surfing with course, him yeah. then i would be getting my own way so it's super fortunate to uh be in that position now again yeah, any nearly want to be parents just get on hurry up and be a parent and get your kids in surfing and they'll love it <laughs> don't don't hang around yeah. and you've just mentioned lauren there obviously your wife she's very creative she's a screenwriter and she's a novelist like um Obviously, you're a real tight family unit. I can see that, and that's uh, an awesome thing. Does like the like surfing for your whole family a big thing? Like for little ones to coming through as well. Yeah, it really is. Like I think, I think you know, especially that level of surfing when you're chasing big waves or chasing competitive surfing, or it can be really selfish. Kind of, or even myself, I'm like, oh, I know this spot's going to be on. Like, I've yeah, got to be yeah. there. Oh, do you yeah. like, do you got to drag, grab your time to go and save that thing that's special to you. But then some of the beautiful moments are when you are saving together, whether it's a one foot wave on a foamy, mm. that is also amazing. Mm. And where we live up in Northumberland at the minute, we're looking at that, it's a little bit of a backwater. Some of the main saving beaches in the northeast are quite busy, but where we are out the front of our house, it's like super chill. It's not the best wave, but it's a pretty chill wave. So. so yeah, she's been really good. She's gone on the journey as well. Um, you know, she's never like a natural like surfer, but she's fully embraced it. and has written, uh, you know, at that same sort of thing. She's a trustee for Surfing and Sewage. Yeah. She's, um, yeah, writing scripts and scri um, She helped uh, consult on the surfing on a large Disney film which shot in Thursday, which was a pretty good one. So she's done some really good stuff, but a lot of it's surfing. It's not all but surfing, but a lot of it's surfing inspired as well. Cool. Yeah, so I, again, I, I think you've answered my next question already. We've, we've heard about your career with Patagonia, we've heard about surfing with your son and your life as a family unit, but what does life look like at the moment for, for Gabe Davis? Gabe Davis. Um, yeah, it's, it's a mad one, this, like right now, it's the last two years has, has been a bit of a reflection point as well, isn't it? I think for everyone, you've got to take a step back and it is that sort of adventure on your doorstep, I think it's important. Passing on to the next generation is super important and um, I would, yeah, I would like the rest of the surf industry to step up and like up their game because I feel like, you know, the the big visionaries in the world are like Greta Thunberg. Do you know what I mean? Like we we take that inspiration from these younger people. Yeah. And we want to leave the world a better place. And whether you, it's how you go about doing that, isn't it? Is you've either got like, you know, SES and Hugh Otago, like phenomenal environmentalists. Um, you know, some people like full on activists or whatever it may be or, or teachers you know you, you can teach the next generation but for my little role within the surf world if I can help pull surf, surf industry in the right direction to me we were always a counterculture industry we were never in it but to be honest we didn't start because of an industry we didn't start no, no. going surfing because no. of an industry but no. you know it's turned into that mm. um, and to me why why isn't surfing the surfing industry a beacon for the way to do business, that is pretty important to me. So we like anything I can do to pull brands in that direction and pull the sport in that direction 
is probably mo the most yeah, modern thing. You make a really interesting point about that counterculture aspect of surfing, and all too often now you hear people complain that surfing is not what it used to be. It's been inundated by kind of, and for want of a better word, outsiders, and it's changed to this or to that. But I suppose there's a really nice draw or pull there for those people that see themselves as perhaps original surfers or counterculture surfers. The the next counterculture thing is to to drag surfing in that direction to be. I think like everyone minded. can be a voice, can they? Everyone can have your in influence on your family and friends, and step up and you know like be the one that picks up the junk on the way home. Like mm. be mm -hmm. the be the P the res pillar, you know, the person of respect within that's your it. community, like you lead by example. Exactly, yes, yeah, like that's the way, and it can just be little things, or it can be the, you know, you start off with little things and then we go mm. on from there. But um, yeah, that's yeah. that's the one sort of shout out to say to, especially the older servers, like, like you guys have to step up because if you don't do it, the young kids will do it, and you're going to do it anyway. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> when your kids tell you to do it, you'll be doing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Gabe, it's uh, it's been an inspiring chat. Thanks so much for your time and for sharing such an amazing life story with us here on Crest in partnership with Elusive. And it's a story that's still getting written, so hopefully we can all catch up again uh, sometime in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it's been an absolute blast today. Thank you. Gabe, obviously, I'd like to say a massive thank you for coming to see us at the Crest podcast, but I also want to wish you all the very best for the summit, the uh, Blue Earth Summit, and I'm sure you will provide that platform for positive action when we're all trying to solve the problem of human impact on our surroundings. So thank you ever so much for all that you do, and uh, yes, thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Wayne. Honestly, it's been an absolute, yeah, it's been absolute brilliant pleasure, and you know, it's been awesome. Thank cool. you so much. So that brings us to the brink of season's two finale, folks. We're still putting together a Christmas edition in which a few more of our listeners' surf travel tales, both disaster and glory, will be aired. As for season three, that will be starting in spring 2022, and we're always super keen for anybody with ideas or feedback. Just email us at castcrest at gmail.com or comment on either of our Instagram or Twitter feeds. Crest, in partnership with Elusive, can be found on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and Google. And do please leave us a review if you're feeling warm about what you've heard today. It all helps, so thanks very much. So... There's just one more guest to go, and I'll hand over to Rob, who will tell you a little more about what to expect in a fortnight's time. Indeed. Thanks, Rhino. Yes, we're going deep into Welsh surfing history and meeting one of the land's most potent living legends. We've hinted a bit as to who that might be, and now it's time to put it out there. I can confirm that Tom Anderson and I will be finishing the Crest Season 2 off in glory, with a bumper video edition discussion with none other than the Gill himself. We've pinned him down, and I can tell you it's going to be something special to celebrate the end of the season with. Expect tales, wisdom, philosophy, foolery, foppery, controversy, and comedy. <laughs> Not long to go, and boy, it'll be worth the wait. Between now and then, though, can we say thanks again to our guest today, Gabe, and to The Way for hosting us. And, of course, thanks to you out there in podcast land for listening and supporting. If we don't see you in the water before then, we'll be back for that season finale in two weeks' time. Diop and Vava. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you, guys. I really look forward to listening to the Gill. <laughs> what a story. Diop and What a story that is going to be. Oh, cool. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.